Didn't he come after you? Um, he what? He called you a Holocaust denier, and then you forced him to retract it, right? Well, I sh I, I tried to get him to sue me um, because I in, in England where the the libel law favours the plaintiff very much, and in other jurisdictions I call him a murderer, a liar, um, a kidnapper, an accomplice to torture and kidnap. Um, uh, and a bogus scholar who had, who had falsified three volumes of memoirs um, based on documents that he had stolen. And several of the reviewers in England said, well, if he doesn't sue on any of this, he's not much of a gentleman. <laughs> Which I already knew, actually, to tell you the truth. So then, he, for a long time, he wouldn't comment when he was asked. And in fact, at, at several occasions, including at the National Press Club in Washington, he made it a condition of his appearance that he not be asked any questions about me. And sometimes people, I'm afraid to say, agreed to those conditions. But finally he lost patience because he did get asked. And he said, well, why should he, why should he answer to someone who abused Mother Teresa and denied the Holocaust? And I thought, what does he care about Mother Teresa? And what's he doing bringing this up? Uh, so I wrote to him, or through a lawyer I wrote to him, I've never done this before, and said, I'll see you in court if you uh, don't take that back. And shouldn't you be suing me? Um, <laughs> and his lawyers replied the following day and said, he, our client undertakes not to repeat the allegation. And I wrote back saying, that's not good enough. You have to withdraw it. He obviously thought it was worth trying. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful smear. And he did retract it. And you can look it up on my website, if you like, the correspondence between us. But that's, I mean, that was a victory of a kind. I wanted to see him in court, because I could then have brought witnesses from Chile, from East Timor, um, from, from Cyprus, from Cambodia, and so on. We, we, were, we were getting it ready. Who could say, well, yes, and furthermore, we can show that the, uh, pl the plaintiff is, um, excuse me, the defendant is a habitual liar and has lied on a number of things and makes a practice of lying and has made a career out of it. We were looking forward to it. So it was the apology I didn't want. But I repeat, the disgrace is that there is no proceeding against, the United, against him by any organ of law or justice in the United States. The United States shelters him as a wanted war criminal, and that the United States opposes the establishment of an international criminal court because it knows that it is sheltering a wanted war criminal. And he would certainly be defendant number one, I presume, in that court. Um, in looking back over your work over the years, one of the things that I've always admired is the way that you have been very consistent in writing about human rights issues and human rights abuses wherever they occur. Uh, Eastern Europe and the Soviet era, Chile, South Africa, the Kurds, before anybody else was writing about them. You've always been a staunch backer of uh, rights for the Palestinians, many other places as well. And unlike a lot of us, you actually seem to, to go to all these places. Uh, and I'm thinking, if the FBI and CIA have 150 pages on me, the intelligence services of many countries must have thousands of pages on you. And I'm wondering whether, in your travels, there have been any key experiences, key encounters that started you on this path, or were the key experiences, were they things that came before you started going to the various hotspots? Well, you make me sound more intrepid than I am, um, Adam, but I would say if you asked what was a formative or turning point experience for me, it would probably be, um, there would have been two in the last decade. One was my last visit to Kurdistan, to um, the Kurdish provinces of northern Iraq. Uh, at the end of the Gulf War, where I, I visited um, Halabja, the town that was uh, destroyed with um, chemical weapons, and where the, the, the wounds that are inflicted by weapons like that stick around for a long time. They, they, they keep burning on people's skin and flesh, and you can, you can see this stuff still sizzling on people. People are still suffering from it. And I, I have a, f a photograph of myself uh, sitting on the unexploded chemical bomb that the Iraqis left behind. They, they tried to destroy the evidence, but they left one behind, and there it is with their Air Force markings and so on. I mention it because sometimes there are people on the right, and some fools on the left, too, who still try and deny that it was the Iraqis that did that. The point I'm making about wh why it had a big effect on me, though, is slightly different. It's this. I realize that here was an unintended consequence of the Gulf War that by accident and as a result of massive uh, international public opinion, because the Kurds ended that war, as you remember, scattered over the hillsides, um, starving and dispersed and dispossessed, 
uh, there, was, there was a forcible international intervention to put an umbrella, a cover, over them, which still exists. And so my question to those who talk too glibly about American imperialism is, would they now demand that American jets stop flying over Kurdistan and stop protecting the Kurds, or not? <laughs> and if they would, and if they would, I'd, I'd of course be very glad to hear their reasons, and if they wouldn't, would they examine those implications? Because I think they're quite... But they're quite important ones. Remember, you know, there are, we think, probably not less than 30 million Kurds, maybe more, in, in Turkey, Iraq, uh, Syria, and Iran mainly, that they're the largest people in the world without a state, uh, that they're the oldest cause of the left in the Middle East. I mention these things because um, it somehow seems to me they don't get mentioned enough. Do you see, in your ideal future, a state for...